and say, Bethlehem United Methodist Church, YouTube worship experience, I am thrilled that you're here today. This is the day that we celebrate the birthday of the church. That's right, the birthday of the church. We call that Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost was the birth of the church, and we celebrate that every year on Pentecost Sunday. We're going to be talking about Pentecost and that first birthing of the church a little later this morning. I'm thrilled that you're with us. But before we go any farther, I'm going to ask Margaret to come and talk to you a little bit more. We started this last week about the covenant relationship that you will form with your new pastor. I've got a few more weeks and, and then uh, I'll be moving on to uh, another congregation and a new pastor coming in here. And so Margaret's going to talk to us a little bit more this morning about that covenant. Congregational fruitfulness requires the mutual commitment of clergy and laity to the centrality of the church's primary mission. And we adopted this covenant today. My covenant or title is Personal Faith and Leadership. We will embody servant leadership, always looking to the best interests of the ministry of the church instead of personal preferences. We will be regular in our worship attendance, give generously financially, and pursue deep personal discipleship. The committee will work with the pastor in keeping this covenant up to date. We are excited about this covenant and our new pastor that will be coming. Thank you. The second lesson comes from Acts. 
When the day of the Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as a fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea, and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the Christian tradition of Luke's account of Pentecost, Jesus tells his followers not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise God had made to them. John baptized you with water, Jesus said, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Luke's account of the fulfillment of Jesus' promise is found in the second chapter of Acts. You just heard it read, but here's that portion again. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place and suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And so, the church was born. Now, our various gospel authors give their unique take on this significant event, or not. Mark doesn't even mention it. And perhaps John's account is my favorite, although if you ask me next year, I could change my mind. I, I think my favorite account might have more to do with what God in Jesus is doing with me through the Holy Spirit at that particular time. But, but John's account is uncharacteristically simple. Uncharacteristically, for John at least. You see, John's account of Jesus giving his first believers the promised gift of the Holy Spirit 
takes place on the day of Jesus' resurrection. Easter Sunday, we would call that. You may remember that text. Jesus appears in the room with his followers, making an unannounced dramatic entrance, even though the doors remain shut and locked. And then Jesus tells us, or John tells us, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. But through the centuries, Luke's account in Acts has been the favored account. Perhaps, in part at least, because of its drama. And Luke's account is quite dramatic. Jews from a wide assortment of nations are in Jerusalem for the Jewish celebration of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is a Greek word meaning 50, referencing 50 days after the Passover. Now, since Jesus was executed during the festival of Passover, Pentecost falls 50 days after the crucifixion. Now, the festival of Pentecost is a Jewish festival, and in our Hebrew portion of our Bible, in both Exodus and Deuteronomy, it is called the Feast of Weeks. So the Feast of Weeks is the same as Pentecost. Well, enough for today's history lesson. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. And Luke describes high drama. And why not? This is the event that the first believers look back to as the empowerment of the movement. Perhaps we over-glamorize it in our minds. But this event is significant for Christianity. It is as significant today as it was 2,000 years ago. Perhaps one of the dangers is to over-glamorize the actual event of 2,000 years ago, making today's reality appear less significant. I suspect we do this to our own detriment. Maybe this is why I like John's simple description. Jesus breathed on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Luke's drama tempts us to believe that if we do not experience those high-velocity winds or shifting grounds or images of tongues on fire, or the ability to speak in languages of other cultures and nations without ever taking language classes, that we haven't had the full experience. Please allow me to correct that notion right now before we go any further. Pentecost, as described in Acts, is a two-time event. I know, some of you thought it was a one-time event. It's described by Luke as happening twice. Just like in Mark's gospel story of the feeding of the thousands, Mark reports that the feeding of the thousands takes place two different times. In Mark's gospel, Jesus feeds thousands of Jews. Then he crosses the lake to the Gentile side and feeds thousands of Gentiles. Acts chapter 2 describes the giving of the Holy Spirit to the Jewish Christians. If you hold on and read on through the book of Acts, you'll come to chapter 10 where Luke describes the same dramatic event for Gentile believers. All of this is high drama and very exciting 
fact, if these events had waited until the 20th or the 21st century to unfold, someone would have made a movie. Hopefully that would have been Steven Spielberg and not Stephen King. Oh, I, I like Stephen King. I'd just rather not turn this into a horror flick. But today's reality is that you have the Holy Spirit. You have the same Holy Spirit with the same power and the same gifts that are seen in our biblical stories. You received this gift in your baptism and you claimed it as your own when you began living into your baptism at what we typically would call your confirmation. But how are we to live that kind of power, that kind of life, that kind of love. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. And in your baptism, you received the advocate the Holy Spirit. Uh, sometimes we read and hear the fantastic stories of faith presented in our scriptures and, and are tempted to think we could never live like that. But we are wrong. The first believers struggled with living out their faith the same as we do. The book of Acts is full of stories of faith and struggle. Acts showcases major divisions, major conflict, even between the apostles as this church moves from being a Jewish faith to a more Gentile-oriented or Gentile-dominant religion. Conflict that that makes our struggles look minor and insignificant in comparison when we read them from the book of Acts. Then we get to Acts chapter 15 and Paul confronts Peter because some Jewish Christians are teaching Gentile Christians that they have to keep the law of Moses if they're going to be real Christians. And even though the apostles all agree that Gentiles are not under the law of Moses, the division continued throughout the rest of the story. The church has never been conflict free, but the church has continued to be the church, even in the middle of conflict. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. But we simply cannot keep Jesus' commandments of unselfish, nonviolent love, at least not in our own ways, not of our own will, and certainly not of our own power. But then we were never expected to live out such all inclusive love by our own devices. I will give you another advocate, Jesus teaches. This is the Holy Spirit who will be with you forever. This is the Holy Spirit who is with you today. If you live for unity and love as Jesus lived and taught, you are living in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Now, in English, we would drop the P and say pneuma, but in the Greek, it's pronounced pneuma. So pneuma means wind. Our English word pneumatic comes from pneuma. Of course, pneumatic tools are air-driven tools. Pneuma means wind or breath or air or spirit. 
Jesus promises the first believers that they will receive the agios pneuma, the Holy Spirit, agios, holy, the Holy Spirit. He promises that they will receive the holy wind, the holy breath, the holy air, or as we usually say, the Holy Spirit. And I love Bob Dylan's song, and I see it so much as a Pentecost song when he says, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. The wind, the pneuma, the air, the breath, the spirit of God. How many times, Bob Dylan says, must a man look up before he can see the sky? How many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? How many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. In the pneuma, the agios pneuma, the holy wind, the holy air, the holy breath, the Holy Spirit. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the Spirit of God, whom you have, who is blowing in your life. Let us pray. All the world looks to you, O oh God. You give us our food in due season. You open your hand and fill all living things with your abundance. So we, your children, by adoption and grace, come to sing our praises to your holy name and to offer our worship to you. You have promised that we would receive all things and you have called us to live in hope. But we are wayward children and become dissatisfied when we cannot see everything we want. You search our hearts and know all that is within us. We are unable to pray as we ought. We have failed to be the witnesses that your grace deserves. We stand under judgment for our sin. Forgive us, O oh God. Your Holy Spirit gave power to your witnesses in the birth of your church upon the earth and enabled them to testify to your power and majesty. Blow through the dusty rooms of your church today that we might go forth in joy and thanksgiving, proclaiming your mercy and love. Your Son promised comfort to those who were in sorrow at his departing. Come now with that same spirit of comfort to those who are filled with fear and distress and give them peace. Send forth your spirit and renew us. Make us new creatures for the glory of your Son in whose name we pray, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now join me as we pray the prayer together, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
So happy birthday, church. Happy birthday. Pentecost, the birthday of the church. The time when we celebrate God giving us the Holy Spirit. God has given you the Holy Spirit. You received the Holy Spirit in your baptism. Now, celebration today is very appropriate. As you carry that celebration into the week, remember you have been empowered to love, to live the life Jesus modeled for us. Go into your week living in the power of the Spirit of God, loving others as Jesus has taught us to live. We'll see you next time.